This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with youth development phase coach for a Cat One Academy, Dan Wright. He discusses his coach mentor role with the player development project, the considerations he has whilst planning sessions, as well as his personal beliefs around the importance of small sided games. I hope you enjoy. Right, perfect. First of all, Dan, appreciate you jumping on. Um, how's your Christmas break? Did you have a nice, relaxing time away from football? Yeah, it was very good, thank you. N- nothing um, nothing super exciting, just a bit of family time. How was yours? Yeah, all good. Um, as as I've, I think I told you before, I tested positive for COVID, which was a bit of a stitch in terms of uh, uh, not being able to go and see family stuff. But the upside is I didn't spread it to a lot of people, so um, that, that was a positive. Um, so I guess for those people that maybe haven't come across you although you're obviously very well known with a lot of the work you do do you just want to talk through kind of what your current roles are and what different projects you have going and all that type of stuff cool okay yeah so um i'm currently uh under 12s lead coach and under 15s assistant coach uh at an academy um i also do a bit of work online for a uh, platform called the player development project which is uh, like a community of coaches where we do some uh, webinars and blogs and, and podcasts and chat with people about coaching stuff so that that's uh yeah that's my kind of day-to-day work for you at the moment obviously life's changed because of covid and all that type of stuff but um i know that you've done a lot of work particularly online kind of looking into different types of sessions how you formulate sessions and all that type of stuff one thing that you've come up a lot with is kind of a small-sided game theory and principles yeah. behind that um, in your experiences, why are they so important um, for kids in their development? Why are they so useful? Yeah, I think it's it's a, a huge, huge question with like many, many different answers. I think um, probably the, the the quick one is like that's why kids play football. I don't think many kids um, turn up to football training or, or or choose to play football to to stand on mannequins and to pass the ball, you know, in a predetermined pattern. I think. Most of them want to stick the ball in the goal or smash someone in a tackle or or make that, you know, fingertip save around the post. So that's why the kids turn up, I think, for small-sided games. I think why, why are they beneficial is probably, you know, we're, we're all on this quest to make, um, you know, help support players make beautiful decisions and great decisions. And, you know, for me, decision-making needs to be in the context and that context is the game. So not always, you know, the game format that they play on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday. It doesn't always have to be LNB 11 or 77, but, but opposed and, and playing with some of those kind of parameters and constraints to to encourage those kind of interactions that we want to help kids make the decisions and to to execute some of those decisions in the context of the game is hopefully the quick answer there, there is a yeah there is kind of more bias and, and, and more kind of a research behind that i guess so what's the what's some of the research behind it from the things that you've seen yeah so i think there's there's tons of research around area size and and, and touches and and different formats and, and the FA have done some kind of great work in the last 10 and 15 years around adapting the format. So, so broadly, the, the smaller the format, the more interactions you're going to get. So a um, bit of an old one, but the Man United 4v4 study is really interesting. So at nines and tens, they switched to 4v4, I think from 6v6. So they had 4v4 with, with four different formats, um, kind of one, one with goals, one with four goals, uh, end line. Uh, there's another one as well. I can't remember what the fourth one was, but but broadly, all, all those kind of uh, small sided games, more touches, more tackles, more more shots, more skills, uh, more kind of one v one duels, all those interactions, and then thinking about the the pitch size maybe linked into to the age group. So at nines and tens, I don't think many people would argue that like like it would make a lot of sense to to stick with that small format. I think maybe one of the things that uh, youth football is guilty of is like rushing towards that LMV11 or or trying to make it look like the adult game as soon as possible. So um, you know the, the the stats around Premier League debuts are, are, are averaging at 23 years of age, and then we're jumping to LMV11 at 12 or 13. So essentially, we're we're 10 years early, pushing them to LMV11 when you know they could still play LMV11, but maybe keep that funnel open of of 77, of 99, of foot sale, of street football, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's there's some research around kind of the the pitch size linking into the physical returns. That's 
it's something I'm not an expert of. So I'm, I'm picking, picking brains of people that are um, sports scientists and, and brighter than me to, to, to link into pitch size in terms of what are we asking the boys to do physically to get up and down the pitch? You know, what areas are they going to cover? What high speed running are they going to do in those areas? So yeah, th there's, there's lots of kind of physical stuff. And then maybe the, the decision making and, and the type of interactions you want. So I've probably fallen into a kind of a constraint led approach and, and learning more about ecological dynamics and all these other big fancy coaching words um, to think about how we can design small set of games or, or practices that encourage the interactions that we want. So rather than maybe um, telling the kids what to do, that you must pass it here and you must do that, can we design practices that create the need? I think that's the that's the kind of the utopia, the, the ideology that we're working towards where we can design a practice or encourage um, yeah, a task that will that will make the kids think about or get attracted to the information we want them to, to, to help them understand the game more rather than us just preaching or, or telling them all the answers all the time. Um, Easier said than done, a lot of that. I think it's uh, interesting what you say about the physical returns because on my A licence, I had, um, I think it was Adam Owens, I want to say, potentially. Yeah. Who, um, yeah. He does a, did a lot of work with Chris Coleman when they were in Wales and then when also when they went out to China as well. Um, and he that was one of the things he mentioned with Gareth Bale that at Real Madrid, they did loads and loads of very tight areas. And he said one of the things for him, because of the type of athlete he was, he needed that ability to almost open it out, yeah. which he wasn't getting all the time, so, which is why he would pick up injuries. Because then on a game day, when he did try and open up it, then his body's not used to it. He said, whereas someone like Ver Jamie Vardy, um, there's, from my understanding, once or twice a week, he'd just have an opportunity to really just open his legs out. And um, he said, but even when he was playing at the lower leagues, he was doing, because he was playing so many games, he, his body was just getting used to be able to open out and sprint and all that type of stuff. So I think the physical constraint is a really interesting dynamic of what's going on at the moment. Yeah. And, and there's, there's loads of kind of layers to unpick there as well, right? Like I think maybe academy football has been guilty of kind of um, creating players or developing players that all look quite similar, maybe technically quite proficient players that play in the middle maybe lots of tens and fours. There isn't many players that like to run in behind. And then if you look at the kind of the offering or the, the diet that is the small side of games, they all look quite similar. So he said, is there opportunity to occasionally play on, on bigger pitches and bigger spaces? And it's kind of, this isn't research led, this is my own kind of hypothesis, but it's just about switching the lens all the time. So when you change the lens, you see something different from the players. Um, so if you train on a big pitch, you know, your athletic players might look better or your, your number nines might, might be able to run in behind and practice those movements. If you play on a small tight pitch, you, you're probably going to encourage, um, you know, less touches, more combinations, more interactions like that. So the more you change those lenses and be purposeful of, of why you're doing what you're doing, then you'll see the kids in different lights. And then maybe those judgments or assessments you were making on them, you'd go, yeah, but when we put them in this environment, we see this. So I'm doing a piece of work at the moment of like um, trying to, I suppose, scratch the surface of what the games program offers. So um, recording stuff around the fixture that you'd already record. So, you know, the score line, the, the pitch size, um, the shape that we played, the shape that they played, whether there were parents watching, hundreds and hundreds of these things I've got on this Excel spreadsheet of which kids are playing in which games and which positions did they play. And then thinking about what the game offered them in terms of maybe using the FA four corners um, and then how they were challenged in those four corners. So rather than just saying, yeah, Mike is rubbish in big spaces, we can go, okay, but why? And, you know, is it the shape? Is it the opposition? Is it the quality of the opposition? Or is it is it who he played with? So trying to get a bit more pers purposeful around, you know, that competition. So maybe talking about small side games in practice and training and also um, what 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 we're seeing in the games and why we're seeing what we're seeing and that cycle between the two, if that makes any sense. I've waffled a bit there. Yeah, no, what was the idea behind doing that for you? Like, what what was there any particular point where you went, I'm confused by this? Yeah, every, every day I'm confused by it. Um, I, the, the catalyst was, so I'm coaching under 12s group um, and it, that's probably right on the, the cliff edge of 9v9 to 11v11. I think in the UK, like 13s is, is seen as an 11 v 11 game and 12s is kind of 9 v 9 towards 11 v 11. So depending on 
which club you're playing or, or, or what the head coach fancy is doing. It can be really different from environment to environment. So you might play 11 v 11 on quite a big pitch. You might go somewhere and play 9 v 9 on what would be like a large 7 v 7 pitch. So you're getting a really like different offering, which which is good. I think that's 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 really you know really healthy for the players. But I suppose if you're a, an under nine or an under 14, what you get is quite consistent all the time. So you play a similar shape on a similar size pitch and you probably get a chance to, to practice stuff. And I think most coaches would, and most people involved in learning would say consistency is quite important. So when you constantly change all of that lens every single week, you, you're going to see different stuff from the kids. And it's probably going to be quite a lot of instability. So I was trying to think about, trying to use that, that um, spreadsheet as like a planning tool and also a reviewing tool of when we when we have like a, a period maybe where we play five games of a similar format, do the kids, you know, are they more comfortable? Do they understand their role a bit more in the team? Do they recognise, you know, I crossed it here last time, I'll cross it again? Or if we play 9977, it's all mixed up. Do some kids still still kind of thrive and do some find that really um yeah derailing and upsetting? So the, the the reason it started because it was I wasn't sure what under twelve football should look like I suppose um, I'd, I'd done it before at a previous club about four or five years ago and it was only nine v nine like we wouldn't have dreamt of playing eleven v eleven so just thinking like I, I was aware of my own bias of like we probably need to do smaller formats and 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 to to keep it kind of lots of variability and lots of um, yeah difference and then there is kind of some other adults that, that think 11 v 11 is the answer so I wanted to justify why I thought what I thought and then maybe seeing why the kids are um yeah getting different returns to do, do, do certain formats you know suit more athletic players or more tactically aware players or the players that have got more kind of maybe training uh, training history or training age so trying to make sense of some of that and then just unpicking some people's some people's brains like some of the FAYCDs I've spoken to uh, to Mark Neville and to Jeff Noonan and then some other some other guys at the Premier League and some other guys at other clubs around like what do you do at this age group and what's the rationale and okay cool and what are you seeing and because we work in quite a linear system so we have to make decisions on children at a certain age and another age and another age yeah trying to be as informed as we can be which is really tough I guess. And in terms of any I guess, early reflections from what you've seen. I appreciate that COVID would have trapped a bit of a spanner in all of this. Is there anything that is particularly highlighted for you at the moment? Um, I'm, I'm really like right in the middle of it. So I'm, I am probably going to sit on the fence a bit. I think one of the things I'm, I'm wrestling with at the moment is whether playing the same format all the time is good um, because the kids are learning the game and they're learning their role and learning their positions and recognizing pictures that they've done before. So, for example, if you play seven games in a row that are 11 v 11 and maybe you're a, a right sided centre back and a, and a full back and you can play in those two positions. If you play seven games in a row and you play 60, 70 minutes of those games, you're going to see similar stuff over and over and over and over, which I think might be good, but it also might be fool's gold because the kids might just be recognizing pictures and, and making decisions based on either maybe the, the, the sessions they've done in the week or the analysis or what the coach has told them to do, rather than when you do mix those things up, there is that kind of five, 10 minutes of like, oh, we're playing a different shape and they're doing this and am I a wing back or am I a winger? And, and that kind of working it out, I think maybe playing the same format all the time, we could be, um, could be stealing some of the learning. So, I've noticed that when we jump from 11 to 11 to 99, there's this, this kind of first 10 minutes of the game where it's like the distances between each other, the distances of, you know, working out the pitch size and then working out what the opposition are doing. Are they playing with two up front? Are they playing with two in midfield, three in midfield? That kind of like almost joust can be removed in the 11 v 11. So I suppose to give more context, the, the year before last, I was doing the under 13s. They only play 11 v 11. We played 65 games. Every single one was 11 v 11, 3 uh, 4 3 3 against 4 3 3, every single game. So then that's like consistent, which is we think is good. Like I think some consistency is important, but it's also really sterile and boring and the same because they're going to press in this way or this way. And they're going to, the midfield, they're going to do this or this because there's only so many things they can do in a 4 3 3 against a 4 3 3 in 11 v 11. In the under the 12s, it's different shapes, it's different pitch size. 
it's um, different formats. And so the kids have to work some of that stuff out. So there's learning happening. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but, th but that's, that's some of the stuff that it's, that's, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm picking at the moment, whether, whether pushing the kids into this, um, this adult kind of centric view of football, when someone shows consistency, does that mean they are a good footballer? Or does that mean that they've recognized some stuff that people have told them and they make predetermined decisions rather than, I suppose the ones that are, that are interesting are the ones that flip between 77 and 99 and 11, 11 and play different positions and constantly solve problems. When somebody does that, you go, that's interesting. So he's played up front, he's played centre mid, he's played right back, he's played in every different format and he's still, you know, um, yeah, impacting the game and, and showing, showing good stuff. That's the ones that you go, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's really interesting. So, and then there's another like spin off of putting kids into positions early and then they learn how to be, you know, a left footed centre back at under 10s and that's what they do until they're, until they're 18. I don't know if that's, that's the right idea. You know, how often, how open do you keep that funnel of kids playing in different positions? So, yeah, I haven't answered the question, but there's a lot, there's a lot of kind of, uh, spin off whirlwinds that, 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 that need exploring. No, I, th I think it's interesting because you you talk about um, the under thirteens doing kind of an entire season eleven v elevens. I'd imagine um, for the kids being able to do different formats would kind of be exciting as well, and maybe break the boredom because I'd imagine they feel it as well if they turn up to a game and they've played Cardiff for seven times already this season. This is the eighth time they play them. Um, they know all the players. The players know them. They're playing against the same person week in, week out. Whereas if all of a sudden you jump in, okay, we're playing 6 v 6 today. Initially, they're like, what? But it's something different. And I imagine for them, it, it, you know, it's, it's just a different psychological challenge and may, maybe, you know, making it, less tedious for them over an entire season which I think is something we talk about burnout I think that is one of the areas that maybe this could link into potentially yeah again I like I haven't done enough to to have a, a qualified opinion but I think there's almost like a bit of a curve here I think the kids always want to play a game that's got two goals where they can smash it past a goalkeeper as soon as they can like play cooperatively uh, under six whatever that's what they want to do I want to play a game and then there does seem to be an age group maybe between 11s to 13s ish where they want to get to 11 11 because that's what it looks like on tv and that's what Ronaldo's doing and I want to play 11 11 because that's the game but then like you said when they get there there are some that you know think that that's brilliant and you know they're they're, they're on the pathway to be the next one and then there's some that you can see that are like this is a bit boring like we've done this We've done it, we've done it, we've done it. So one of the things I was talking to some of these kind of mentors, I guess, about is what happens if we turned up and played 3v3 for half an hour and then 11v11? So what happens if, you know, using your example, what happens if we played Cardiff and we turned up and played 3v3 or 4v4 with, you know, normal goals, goals with goalkeepers, four goals, back-to-back -back goals, line ball, whatever. We did that for half an hour and then we played a real game in, in the commas um, afterwards. And my kind of bias would be that the kids are pretty open to all of this stuff. It's the adults that are the problem. Uh, the kids, if you went, let's play 3v3 and 11v11, they go, okay. Or let's play 77 and 11v11. Or this week we do this and then this. They very rarely go, but damn, we should be playing 11v11 because that's what Salah's doing and you know, that's what I should be doing. They very, you know, I've, I've not heard that conversation. So I think it's the adults around the game that need a bit of, um, I suppose, healthy challenge, don't they, around, you know, why can't we do that? Why, why isn't that okay? Because, you know, Growing up, I would have played every format, you know, in the playground and in the street and then with my mates. Because when you're at training, if you have 16 guys, you play 8v8. You don't play 11v11, do you? So the game doesn't always need to look like 11v11. So, yeah, that's some of the stuff that I'm trying to, to fathom out. And, you know, do we ask the kids enough? Like, you, you, you raise the point. We don't really ask the kids, like, what format would you like to play? Like, cause we organise it for them, don't we? But imagine if you turned up against Cardiff and said, you know, what do you want to do? What, what would you guys like to do today? That that would be an interesting uh, interesting conversation. Yeah, I think. Well, the last game we played before Christmas, we actually did similar. So we under elevens, we did six v six for six v six. Yeah, six v six for the first forty minutes, and then went into a nine v nine after that. Um, and the kids, when I first walked in, they were like six v six, and I was like, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> not 7v7, 6v6. I was like, yeah, 6v6. I said, and then everyone gets to play. And the minute I said, you all get to play for those 40 minutes, everyone was on board. The yeah. minute I said that all of you are going to be on the pitch the entire 40 minutes. So before we even get to 9v9, you're going to be able to play 40 minutes of just football. All of them were like, okay, then. Um, I'm so, in. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in. Whatever you say, six v six, absolutely fine. So I think it does it does highlight that there's probably going to be you know those opportunities if if you take them, and you'll see different bits from different players, and it, it proposes different questions for them, which I which I think is interesting. Did Did you see different things playing six v six and then a nine v nine with the kids that? looks more competent or less competent in different formats? Yeah, I, I think so. I think not so much competence, more just the challenge they had was very different. So you've gone from um, a goalkeeper in the 6v6 basically being able to strike it an entire pitch to then yeah, to the goal. Yeah. it's really, you know, really big pitches and it's a lot greater distance. You know, in the six in the 6v6, it's essentially a series of 1v1s. If you can get past your players, all of a sudden we've got an overload. So now you're getting loads of decisions of how do I beat someone 1v1? How do I receive to beat that player? Yeah. Um, how do I recover? How do I delay to let my teammates get back in? Whereas in a 9v9, if you're the 10 and you get beaten, you've probably got another seven people behind you to kind of... Um, be able to get you out of jail if you like. So it, it, very, very different in that. So I think that it definitely had some benefits. And I think we, we spoke about it after. It's something we'll try and do again, just because one, it helps with the lads game time. Cause you know, particularly with everything going on at the moment, we want everyone to play as much as we can, but two, it just highlights different things with different players that you go, oh, okay, maybe that's something that we can work on because when we went into one V one here, he was really comfortable receiving off his, right foot but as soon as it came in on the left he struggled to you know be able to plan on that one so uh, and, and and some of you kind of touched on is the this sounds a bit radical so it might sound like i'm one end of very far one end of one spectrum but the idea of substitutes in youth football is is a bit weird so like if you stop and think about it if you when you were at school say you were whatever age 10 11 12 you don't have substitutes in the playground, do you? You don't have, like, we're going to play 6v6 and you three can stand here and wait and come on at half time. That wouldn't have happened at school because you want to play. So, yeah, using your story of everyone gets to play, oh, cool. But then, similar to this rush towards 11v11, we're okay with playing 11v11 and having, you know, three or four kids sat on the bench or playing 9v9 and having five kids sat on the bench. And, like, that's a very adult way to look at football. It's It's not a very... No kid would choose to be a sub. No kid, you know, puts the kit on in the morning, gets in mum and dad's car and goes, can't wait to be on the bench and, and impact the game. Like, however we try and sell it to them, no kid really wants to do that. They don't want to, they want to be in the starting lineup and to have that face off and to, you know, be, be running around from minute one. So that's something, again, that I think we need to look at as, as, uh, as adults. So looking at how often do kids start games? How many minutes do they play? And, and then like, Really, I suppose a child-centric view would be we've got this many kids, like you said. What's the best format to get as many of them as the pitch as, as possible? And I don't think that's a way that most people look at youth football. They go 13 to about 11 to 11, so we'll do that. Well, you could play two 99s and maybe get everybody on the pitch, like, for example. So that, when you stop and think about some of this stuff, it does make you think, like, why do we do it like that? It's just just kind of the culture or the, the tradition, I suppose, challenging, you know. Or driving it all. Yeah, and it, listen, it takes a little bit of work. Like <laughs> when we were flipping the pitches around and stuff, that takes a little bit of work to be able to do that. But the benefit of it is, as a coach, I'm not having to worry about game time right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So straight away, I can go, okay, everyone's played 50% game time. So before I go start at any other point, everyone has got 50%. So that's really easy. That that makes my life after that really easy. And then we, we got to a stage where, you know, people are playing 70 minutes out of an 80-minute game, 80 minute game, which is they get to come off a quick breather, a quick drink, and then basically get back on again, which definitely helps. So I think that um, it's definitely something you can explore. And I appreciate some people say, well, they need to learn positions and stuff. And there is... I agree there is a need for them to see pictures that they might see as they go through the pathway so that they can, um, you know, try and begin to think about some decisions that they can make off the back of that. But I think there are also benefits of just allowing 
um, allowing a different format for different challenges, um, I think is definitely something which we for sure. Yeah. And that percentage of game time is is something like yeah, through the player development project, we we interact with a lot of coaches, and that that is one of the the kind of massive challenges that grassroots coaches face, like how many players to sign and then another good player comes out of the woodwork and he wants to sign and I've got too many and all that kind of stuff. So for coaches that are working in youth football, maybe keeping a record of, you know, how, who, who starts, who finishes, how many minutes do they play and then how often do they get to start and finish a game? I think that's, that's a real, um, yeah, real rarity, I think, in, in academy football and grassroots football for a, whatever age, 11, 12, 13 year old to start minute one and to play the whole game and come off. Because we've got so many players who make subs, you know, you, you would say in there, people playing 70 minutes, like, do we keep a record of when someone starts and finishes the game? So that kind of physical and psychological to kind of manage yourself to, to be able to play four periods or 80 minutes or whatever, whatever age group they're doing. It isn't something that happens a lot when you, when you go back through the data, there'll be a lot of kids that play 60s and 70s, but not many that will experience that kind of tiredness and making decisions under fatigue and, you know, dealing with that ball in behind and that runner in the last minute because, you know, they've already done 60, 70 minutes. That isn't something that we that we afford the kids a lot. So, again, using a document to kind of plan and, and review whether that stuff is actually happening is, I'm finding really useful. I've only started it this year in this much depth, but it's been it's been enlightening. Um, and then trying to, yeah, trying to create, well, this kid's going to play 18 minutes today because he's the only one that hasn't done it. Or, you know, we're going to try and keep these three centimetres on the pitch the whole game and give them the experience of defending that large space when they're really, really tired. Um, I suppose it all comes back to intention, right? Like what are you planning? And then are you able to, to deliver it or to design a practice that, that helps deliver it? So I guess linking this into practice design, obviously small side of games, as you alluded to earlier, is, is a big makeup of kind of your sessions and a lot of people's sessions around the country. And I know that you've done a, an e-book, which is currently on sale, kind of looking at the process in which to uh, create small sided games, but then also um, maybe some examples and stuff that people can use. For you, what does your planning process look like around a topic? So, say for example, we're um, I'm, tr I'm trying to pick one that isn't going to stitch you up too much. Maybe we're looking at defending in wide areas, for example. Yeah. What would your planning process be in order to get to a stage where there's a small sided game at the end where they're explicitly or implicitly working on defending in wide areas. Why is it at the end? Good. Why, why, why why the end? That's, that's another tradition. Yeah. You do this, you get a game. If you eat your, if you eat your mains, you can have a dessert. Um, so just, just to rewind, I think a little bit, like I think broadly there's three ways to think about planning a session. I might look like an idiot here. There might be 25, but I think there's, there's only three. I think there's the theme first. So we've got, Defending in wide areas, and that drives our kind of planning and our decision making. We've got individual first. So we've got Mike and Dan in a session today. So we'll probably do something around this. So if you and I were um, both central strikers, we probably wouldn't worry that much about defending in wide areas. We'd do a topic or a session or a practice that, that helps you and I get better. And then the third one would be team first. So what is the collective idea and what we're trying to improve? So in a theme first, it would be everything is driven by the topic you know whether it's defending in wide areas and attacking in wide areas and how do those two argue with each other or whatever the topic is and then topic comes first and then how do the kids filter into that topic or we've got seven kids tonight and three of them are center midfielders and two of them are number nines we could probably do a practice that looks a bit like this or in a theme first all of those kids would get you know the theme that that we think is, is on the curriculum is on the schedule and then the team first is probably um the least appropriate for age you know for, for age appropriate and, and and youth football so you think it may be something that would help the team get better at a topic so maybe playing out from the back and putting kids in positions and giving them some ideas around this is how we do it so that, that's broadly like the three different ways of approaching a session and i think i would probably flip from all three of those so there'll be times where the the theme of the week or the, the, the curriculum or the topic is x and we're going to coach that and there is times where people will play out of positions and people will, will learn stuff about that. And then there'll be other times where the topic disagrees with the kids I've got in the session. So maybe I will go slightly off the plan because actually the session that would help these kids is this one. And then 
probably re- you know less less common in, in youth football would be the team first that we really got to help the team be better at switching play through midfield so that looks like this and it will be a bigger practice and a bigger space and it might there might be occasions where we're more coach led because we're, we're helping them but i'll try and answer the question now so the 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 defending in wide areas so we've got the topic that would be like coming in at the top of the, the, the funnel and then I suppose there's a few different things to consider. I have made a list here because I thought I'd, I'd list some, uh, leave some of them off. So the, 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 the way I would think about it initially would be, what does this look like um, for this age group? So the, the FA use the three R's of realism, relevance and repetition. So the realism would be, what does it look like under 12s? So how can we paint a picture that is relevant to under 12 football? So it probably isn't a full 11 a side pitch. It's, it's probably a, a certain area with a certain number of people in. The relevance would be how relevant that is to those people um, in front of us. So that might be using age appropriate language, but it might also be, you know, um, Dan's working on attacking 1v1 and Mike's working on defending 1v1. Well, in wide areas, we could put those two up against each other as a fullback and a winger and, and, and get them some repetition of that. And then the repetition is whether we want that repetition to be really high or whether we want it to be quite like a game. So if you use defending in wide areas and maybe we split the, the small set of game into three uh, vertical thirds, then we could encourage, you know, you must visit a wide area before you can score. If you go wide and score, you get three points or whatever kind of task constraint you want to put on. We're going to get more repetitions then. So we're going to get more interactions of Mike versus Dan in a 1v1 uh, and, and, you know, that, that jewel and that face up. That's what we want to practice. Or do we play a more free game and those repetitions might be lower, but they might be really real? Because if we, if we encourage that interaction or design that opportunity to happen over and over and over and over, um, that repetition might be high, but the realism might be quite low because you want to attack through the middle, don't you? So you wouldn't always go wide first. Then we'd want to think about maybe like how much challenge or success or consequence do we want to put around the session? So we do want it to be really challenging for the defender. So you might put him in a, in a 1v2 situation. So um, if you're a defender, maybe I'm attacker. You wouldn't have many problems if I was the attacker. But I'm the attacker and I've got an overlapping fullback. So now you're defending in a 1v2, high stress. Um, I'll get loads of success. You'll get loads of challenge. So thinking about how much challenge and success we want the kids to have in the session. And then touched on this on the, on the relevance, but the area size and shape. So we kind of, uh, yeah, we dived into this. In the intro didn't we but thinking about do you want this size to be really big so mike might get practice of defending balls in behind or defending large areas in a 1v1 or do you want it to be really tight so that mike gets cover and balance from his mates and then the 1v1s are quite quite quick and sharp and then maybe not in pitch but maybe defending wide areas but might start to think about pitch size so is it is it funneled off is it a diamond is it you know full width of the pitch or do we come a bit tight all those kind of things to think about what interactions do we want to paint? Because I suppose my coaching approach would be the more we can manipulate this stuff, the more the practice and the flow of the game will teach the players rather than the coach teaching the players. So if we want you to defend, we want you to practice defending when wingers cut inside, then we would funnel off the pitch, cut off the corners and make, you know, the, the practice makes the player come inside. So rather than when he comes inside, defend like this and he does it twice in a session, if I do a kind of funneled off diamond pitch, then the kid's going to do that every single time, especially if you put them on the wrong side, you know, an inverted winger. And then kind of that kind of Jedi coaching of now the practice is, the, is encouraging the interaction that I want. And Mike is getting repetition of defending inside in a 1v1. Um, and then some, some other small things around maybe where does the ball start from and can we, can we kind of manipulate and control? You know, if it always starts with the goalkeeper or does it start with a throw in or does it start with a switch and then we move on to this thing? And then the last kind of two things, I suppose, on my list would be uh, how do we keep score? Like, how do we win? Um, not that winning is everything, and that's probably a separate podcast for another day, but kids want to be competitive. And keeping score in training and practice drives a certain standard. So, you know, is there, is there, is there a competition, competition between you and I? So how many times can I get past you in a 1v1? Or is it do we keep a score or, you know, whatever the, the mechanism we, we do, whether it's, kind of micro individual or it's more macro with the team then when we do conversations or when we're you know um, asking the kids to reflect on how the practice went that score is one of the indicators of that the session's been good 
maybe the last one would be like coach approach. So are we going to be set the practice up, stand and observe quietly and, and see what we can observe? Or are we going to be like riding them and, and really shouting at the fullback to make sure he's getting tight? Or are we going to be somewhere in between and breaking up with, with Q and A's and interventions? So a million things to consider. I've tried to just, yeah, paint brush a few of them, I suppose, but that, that would be some of the things that, that I would consider. And then I would do loads of scribbles um, and often sit down with the, the coach that I'm working with and go, these are the kids we've got. This is the theme, or this is the theme. And these are the kids we've got. This is what I'm thinking of doing. What, what do you see? Um, and then, yeah, you, you kind of co-coaching guy would go, mm, I wouldn't do that or think about this or remember that kid's got this target, so he should play here. And then whether it's, you know, whole part whole or we do skill, skill game or do we just do a whole game? So, yeah, there's, there's so many, so many kind of variables to, to have a go with there. I think one of the really interesting discussion points um, which, which someone brought up to me again whilst I was on my A license, which I'm not sure the answer for, to be honest with you, is the repetition one. Um, because we were talking about finishing and finishing the attack, which uh, every academy, it seems like up and down the country, no one can finish. <laughs> it seems like everyone says we get, you know, we create loads of chances, we play out from the back really well, but then we get into final third and at times we find it really challenging to score goals. Um, and everyone was coming up with practice designs where you get loads of interactions, loads of finishing. And one of the FA uh, YCDs mentioned, he said, why are we doing loads of repetition? And we were like, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, in a game, they don't get 20 chances in a five minute spell. They get three over a game. So surely they need to learn how to do th three well rather than 20 over a short period of time what's your experiences kind of around the repetition thing and what yeah what what are your biases regarding it it's a good um it's a good kind of like red herring to chuck in isn't it i, I don't know I, I suppose i can see both angles um the 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 fayct there is talking about maybe realism for me rather than repetition so if you want to get good at anything, you need to repeat it, right? So as you probably guessed from this conversation, I'm not a drills based coach, but if you want to get good at stuff, you need to practice a lot. So if you and I, you know, want to learn a language or drive a car or learn any new skill, you can't just turn up and do it three times. So if you were going to give a public speech tonight on the new tiers of coronavirus, and you, you know, Boris Johnson's phoned you up and said, can you, can you address the nation live and can you deal with the, the zoom conversations and the media giving you difficult com you wouldn't want to do that for the first time in front of everybody would you You'd want to practice a few times so i think if we want to be good at anything we probably need to practice a lot that comes back to that consistency piece when we're talking about the games and finishing is probably the hardest part of the game like that's why strikers are the most expensive players broadly the most expensive players or consistently the most expensive players because it's the best skill right it's the hardest skill to beat people and stick it in the goal and I think if you want kids to be good at that, you probably need to design in a lot of opportunities for it to happen. So I wouldn't be against using that approach within the week. So nope, you only get five goes at this and it's really real. Or, you know, the game's only for three minutes and you might only get in once. I, I think that kind of consequence driven approach is, is really cool. And, you know, kind of time is one of the constraints around or opportunities is, is one of the constraints around a game but if we want kids to be good at stuff they need to practice it a lot i think my bias would be academy football is really good at playing out from the back and possession-based football because that's what we practice there are very very few academies that smash it over the top someone runs in and scores there are very few that do that and then i suppose we've kind of already hinted that i think that that develops a certain type of player um, similar to like maybe why central defenders kind of head the ball in academy football because they don't get many opportunities to do it they don't play many teams that that pump it long and are direct and so then the guys can't head the ball and then maybe they go out on, on loan to a, a, a lower league or they get to a certain level where they're expected to you know win a header against a really powerful center forward like a, a Raul Jimenez or somebody and they can't do it because they haven't practiced so yeah I, I would I would design in opportunities like that but it wouldn't be my my go-to I think repetition probably needs to be quite high if you want someone to be good at something so if you like the repetition side particularly in youth football and maybe as you get older you can you can win that off why don't you like drills because drills to a certain degree allow you to get that repetition in in a you know set 
way, if you like. Yeah, I think that uh, it's about context. Um, for me, well, probably need to start at the start. A drill for me would be um, something that's A to B to C. It's predetermined. It's coach controlled. It's um, it's boring. Um, <laughs> I'm not against unopposed practice. I think there is space and, um, yeah, through the player development project, we would talk about like the footballer's diet. I think unopposed practice and isolated practice and me practicing on my own, maybe away from my team is, is important and is useful. And when you talk to any players that have played a certain level, or you read any autobiography, a lot of them will talk about, I did this away from the game or I did this extra. I suppose I would be mindful of if you've got the kids for an hour in a grassroots setting or you've got them for 90 minutes twice a week, they want to be there to play a game. They're going to probably learn more skills in an opposed setting, which doesn't have to be a game, but you know, it's more, more like a game. So that's probably what we should spend our time doing. Why I'm not a fan of a drill is because the, the, the kind of research around skill acquisition would be that the learning needs to take place in the context. And for that skill to be, um, adaptive to, you know, to pressure, to the surface of the ball, to what the goalkeeper is doing. We need that variability. And when we, when we lower that variability in a drill, we remove some of that transfer for it to happen in the game. That's, that's my understanding and definitely my bias because my kind of, um, yeah, my, my small sided game, I don't know, quest probably started from, from when I was a player and I would be involved in a lot of unopposed, um, yeah, boring stuff. And it would be, I made a joke about it earlier, but it would be like, let's do this and then we can play a game. Well, that isn't why I turned up. I didn't turn up to wait for my time and then for you to tell me where to pass or for you to tell me where to score. Um, so yeah, that, that, that would be, that would be my approach to that. But I do think the, the context around number nines, the feel of putting the ball in the goal is quite important. So I, you know, I, I would encourage number nines to practice that quite a lot, but whether they need to do it, in the group time, if you've got 15 kids that have all made the effort to get there and to be there at a certain time, do we need to do that thing there? Or can they do that practice away from the training or before training where they're practicing maybe the real intricacies around left footed finishing or finishing with one touch or whatever. And then I suppose our job is to maybe um, decide whether that practice is useful in our diet of the week or of, of what those kids need. So in attacking from wide areas, which was defending wide areas, which was your example, there will be one touch finishes. So do we do, you know, a practice that's a lead in of one touch finishes from crosses? If that was the example, or if you want high repetition, the best place to do that is unopposed. If you want realism, then you're probably going to have to add, add in some defenders. So it's all these dials and trade-offs, right? Like it isn't that repetition is king and repetition is everything. It's about what does each kid need in, in each moment. So the more real we make it might mean that our repetitions go down. So we've got to kind of got to trade all those things off. But I suppose just being aware that once you turn one dial up, you're probably turning the other one down. And that might be fine if that's what you planned. But if you planned for it to be really real, so similar to your FA YCE guy, really real will be three chances in a match within full contact, tight space is really difficult to get in is what you want. So yeah, it comes back to intention of the session. I think I'm having a play around with this at the moment because I, I love watching other sports, particularly those out in America, so things like uh, basketball, NFL, etc. And you look at basketball players and one of the things they always do is loads of shots, loads of repetition, and they'll move off into a certain area and then they'll take the shot. Um, most of them attribute success or progress to this, and I'm kind of like, okay, so how does this work in football and stuff? I think one of the ways that I've played around with it that has worked quite well is doing it as an arrival activity. Yeah. And when we talk about drilling, for example, rather than being the mainstay of your session, it could literally be something that you set up two or three areas and as the kids arrive, they drip feed into this practice and then they get goes at the skill as they arrive. So yeah. rather than it being your entire team, it might be you've only got three players, but at the moment these three players are all doing something related to a target and they're getting an opportunity to do it. And that might help them get 20 shots before Tommy, who's arriving five minutes before the session gets here, they get an extra 20 shots, whereas normally it might be that kids are, you know, doing ball mastery or, or anything like that. So I think that there's... Um, 
that's something that I've played with, which I've seen some real benefits of. Um, and then the other, the other area that, and I probably need to investigate this more is how you can integrate these things into sessions. Um, so say for example, we're talking about finishing, it might be that you've got a possession practice going on in the central areas and then on a call or on a ball drop or whatever, you play a secondary or third ball in the kids break out of that, go in to try and finish before they then come back into the practice. Um, and I've done it a couple of times and what it does do, it works quite well because it's there in the moment you're getting your three repetitions that we alluded to earlier. There's pressure on it because, you know, they're being chased down by defenders and all that type of stuff. So I think that's something that moving forward, I need to try and work on the integration of how you can integrate maybe those little interactions into your sessions. That's just a small little breakaway thing from the mainstay but allows them to get used to that pressure of being through and go on a 1v1 or anything like that. Yeah, I think this is where like small sided games and constrained approach, they have crossover, but they're not exactly the same thing. So there can be, there can be times where kids feel like they're playing a game and like it's, it's competitive and fast paced and full of decision. But it isn't a traditional game in the sense that it's uh, two goals and 11 v 11. So using, I, I, I did a practice very similar to what you're talking about, literally the week we broke up before Christmas, where we, we were fortunate to have a whole pitch. This was with the under 15s. We, we had a whole pitch. Um, I'm going to try and explain this, which is not easy in, in podcast world. At the one end, we had a goal with a goalkeeper. In. Then we had a free penalty box and then a line, an offside line of mannequins and a number nine. Um, he was unopposed. He was there on his own. Then on the halfway line, we had a possession box. So it was a 4v2 rondo. And then right at the other end of the pitch, funneled off because we didn't use the other goal, we had the back four. So this was kind of, I suppose, an example of what I was talking about with theme and individuals first, like which ones were we? So we had these individuals, so we designed this practice. And the theme was about um, the midfield three uh, counter-pressing or looking to win the ball back really quickly. So the... Uh, two that were in the rondo uh, to try and win the ball back were actually working with the back four and the four who started in possession they got a point every time they made 10 passes and then when the two won it they had to go backwards first so the back four had to practice playing up from the back and the midfield four which was like the uh, it was a four eight ten and we had one wide player because of, of who we had those four that started in possession when they lost it they had to spring out and try and press the back four to stop them playing out. So we had some pitch geography of the five lanes that we were using. So those four would, would sprint and try and win the ball back. And behind the back four, we had four target goals. So basically if the back four lost the ball, it was a goal. So those four scored by making 10 passes or, or regaining and scoring. And the back four, um, so that the midfield, the midfield two that were ratting around trying to win the ball back, they played back to the back four. Back four had to play forwards through the, the number nine who was unopposed. And he went through and did a 1v1 because his individual learning plan is 1v1s against the goalkeeper. The back four are practicing playing out. The midfield four are working on a counter press after they lose it. So that's an example of like, it felt like a game. It was directional. It had scores. It had a consequence if you lost the ball. You know, if you lost the ball, you had to run. If you won the ball, you got to keep it and, and win and get a success. But it wasn't a match. It wasn't a, a small set of game that was you know, two goals and, and uh, fully directional. So that's that's an example of like an unopposed practice. It wasn't a drill because the ball went into the number nine in loads of different ways. Sometimes it was into feet. Sometimes it was slid down the side. Sometimes the goalkeeper came out really early and, and smothered it. Um, but he probably got, I, I, I have got the SNC report somewhere, loads of high-speed running to get in behind. He probably got 40 finishes in that game. Um, and the other guys worked on things that they're working on. So the back four were playing out using a variety of methods and switching playing and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's how you can maybe design in um, unopposed. So each kid is maybe unopposed, he's getting what he needs, opposed they're getting what they need, the transition and an element of, of it being directional. Um, but it takes a lot of scribbles. Like that was four kind of pieces of paper where people, when that won't work because of this, and we need to add that constraint because this kid will cheat and do this. But it's really good fun, like when you get it right, right? Like when it when it comes off and people are, are getting what they need, it's a, it's a nice feeling. Yeah, it is. And I think that um, 
I probably realized this as I got a little bit older, like your session, my sessions, the first time I try a new session very rarely goes right. Or sure. right in inverting commas. Most of the time I come away and go, bloody hell, what was I thinking putting that in? Or why did I not even realize that was going to happen? But what, what I've got better at is the scribbles make the session almost legible for the players they can get through it and then the second time round it'll be a little bit better the 13 13 third time round it'll be a little bit better for and then probably fifth or sixth time we've got a session where you know I know that it works I know the constraints I can put on to help the kids I know what outcomes are going to come from it um and I think sometimes the bravery of a coach is just going you know what this could be a car, car crash this session I'm going to try it with the players that I've got I'm going to try this this could be a car crash but even if it is there's going to be some positive outcomes in that session mm -hmm. and 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 maybe like the the hack or the cheat is to be really vulnerable so that session that I spoke about was the first time I've ever kind of done it and like it was co-created with another coach. So I had an idea and he, he tweaked it. So that that's uncomfortable because it's no, no longer not my plan. It's our plan and our. And then put it on a tactics board and showed the kids and say, I literally said, don't know what this is going to look like. So it might be too big because we use basically three, maybe 80% of a pitch. That's massive. When he had, uh, I think, 12 kids on the pitch. And I, I really kind of open went, this might be rubbish. Like this is, the, this is our intention of what we're trying to practice. And, and for you, it's this. And for you, it's that. And we want to practice you doing this. And, and the kids, then when you show that vulnerability and show that kind of coach approach, when you do a set of, say, six minutes, that'll be the first worst one. They're working it all out. Talk to them. Everyone got it? Anyone got any questions? And then when you do it again, they'll go, we need to change this bit, Dan. Or it's too easy for them. Like, can we make it harder for them to score? Or, you know, they've got to do this first. Or we do this, we get double points. Or, you know, if the goalkeeper wins it and plays out, we get this. Once you get into that space, that's where it's like, again, really, really like rewarding. Because not only the kids kind of buying into the learning process, they're, they're probably thinking about the game a bit. Like, it would be more real if we did this. Or it would be better for me if this challenge happened. Like, I'm getting too much success. So I want this bit to happen. But again, that isn't something that happens overnight. You've got to probably show that vulnerability for quite a while. But you tell me, like, it's your practice. Is it easy? Is it hard? Do you want to make it harder? Um, and that starts with the really young ones. I don't think that's something that just older players can do. So, yeah, we will talk to the 12s about, like, the level of challenge. And we've been using the, the Nando's Piri Pepper. To, to talk about level of challenge and like how challenging is this session at the moment okay how challenging do you want it to be can we make it harder because we had a bit of experience of like the kids say they want challenge and then when you give them challenge they're like oh this is a bit challenging i don't like it so if we reference that kind of mental model of we want it to be extra hot today so extra hot looks like i'm on the ball lots of contact lots of whatever lots of psychological challenge lots of winning and losing and then we do a session that's really medium and lemon and herb and it'll be quite comfortable and easy. And then we go like, is this extra hot? No. Okay, how do we make it extra hot? Well, we could add in these things. Cool. Once you get into that space, and it is a, it is a long process, it's, I, I find it really enjoyable. Yeah, and I think it's, it's good for the kids and in the younger age groups, although they might not be able to articulate exactly what they mean, good way of, of, I've always found is if... Um, they 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 want to find ways to win so if they want to find shortcuts or little cheats in order to win they'll be like well you never said this so i'm gonna find this loophole and you're like okay right you're right i didn't say that so now this is a stipulation or constraint i'm gonna put on to make sure that you can't just do that i think that's a really good way but the, the, yeah the, the kids will always find little loopholes or ways and as they get older they can hopefully then articulate and say well no at the minute i'm finding this too easy or i can just do this so why don't we just put this in place and it will stop me doing that and then causes um yeah. a different area i guess one thing you've mentioned quite a lot um and I agree with it, and you probably work with it in more challenging age groups, is the competitive nature uh, of academy football. So we talk about people wanting to be challenged and we want it to be competitive. What will then obviously come with that at times can be some real positive learning um, environments and learning examples, but also some quite challenging times for, for players, um, both technically well tactically technically physically emotionally how do you go around managing that 
in your session kind of those interactions to not get to a stage where you've got kids walking off or or that type of stuff yeah i think that um probably in like an academy setting or a high performance setting it's it's um it's necessary it's unavoidable that it needs to be competitive you know if you want to if you want to be really good at anything you probably need to spend a lot of time in that hot zone in that you know it being really difficult and really stretching not all the time like there's still time for it to be really fun and, and enjoyable and silly but if we want to be good at something it needs to be yeah quite quite tight and fast and ugly a lot of the time i think um if you were coaching in a school setting not as important i think it's probably more about participation and engagement and, and fun and and so then there will be kids that are super competitive and there'll be the ones that aren't and it, that's that's a different challenge in in the setting that that i work in i would be really explicit with the kids around what do you want training to look like most of them will say that that you know will, will have the same kind of values or approach to you there will be one or two that won't but most of them will go we want it to be this and it cool and then just making sure you've understood. So you said you want this, 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 and this, okay? And then I suppose we we would kind of play out or contract. What happens when this happens? So what happens when you lose? Or what happens when it gets really competitive and you don't like it? What should we do then? And there'll be some kids that will say, don't talk to me. There'll be some that say, make sure your refereeing's good. So sort of understanding maybe what will create that needle, like what will create that problem. Because I know that there's kids in the session that I could... Um, ruin their day by giving a crap refereeing decision that will absolutely rattle some of them there'll be others that like you know um if we've got a player less or if the teams aren't fair their heads will completely go or whatever and then i suppose yeah once you've contracted it and kind of set expectations occasionally like when it goes wrong and wrong in in the sense that maybe people are upset or frustrated or disappointed if appropriate coming back to those expectations remember you said you wanted this or um yeah we, we did talk about it was going to be like this and then also occasionally just doing nothing so there'll be times where i will know somebody's upset and they're not happy with me or they're not happy with the practice or they're not happy with their teammates and that's okay and then maybe picking up those pieces the next session or the next game going on tuesday i noticed this and they, and some for some it will have completely left their head by the time they've got in the car and they've driven home it's it's gone and there'll be others that will be harboring that refereeing decision for a, a couple of weeks there's a lad in the, the under 14s that i coached like a year ago who still calls me the worst referee he's ever had because he's remembered that one game where i've cheated him in an offside and then yeah with with so knowing the individuals i think so yeah referencing that stuff but knowing the individuals of occasionally i'll be kind of um i'll pull one kid out and go we're going to do this today i'm going to referee against your team and it's going to be really horrible and you're not going to like it and then putting them back in or doing it and then telling them afterwards, do you know why we're doing that? And I think similar to how we've talked about developing football skills, if we want kids to be developing psychological skills and there's loads of buzzwords of resilient and great and whatever, if we want kids to be those things in a match, we have to practice them in training. We can't, we can't chuck them into the heat of playing a game against an Arsenal, a Spurs, a Man City, whoever, and then go, Oh, they don't enjoy that when they're one nil down or they don't enjoy playing against a bigger boy or when they don't get loads of success, they can't handle it. Okay. So we need to design similar to, you know, if you want to improve on your left foot, we need to design in some of those things in practice so that the kids are getting an opportunity to learn it. But I think if you're really honest and explicit and kind of transparent with it, most kids find it okay. They don't enjoy it in the moment. They still hate you for that 30 seconds or that evening. Um, and then, I suppose one of the things I've, I've missed out would be occasionally I would phone the parents. If it gets to a point where I think I've really upset him there or the practice has really upset him or, you know, Mike did such a good job in that 1v1 that he didn't get a sniff, didn't get a single shot on goal tonight. Occasionally I will phone the parents and go, Billy had a tough night at training tonight and this is what happened. But I want you to know that we've seen it and, you know, we're doing it because of X, Y, Z. I think, again, if you're transparent with your approach and, um, we're doing this to try and encourage this then you don't you don't find many problems um that doesn't mean that we don't have flare-ups and we don't have tears and we don't have you know people calling each other cheats and all that kind of stuff. those things still happen but i suppose occasionally we just use some of those approaches to go hang on a minute this is what you said you wanted or mike remember you told me you wanted it to be challenging this is it being challenging 
some some of those strategies have, have found to work. I, I think what's interesting there and is kind of obviously you have to know the players, you have to know what their trigger points are and stuff. One one thing I've had experience of, which I think is really interesting, is it's not tribal. I'm trying to think about where this, but it seems tribal. Like on a game day, they'll all be together, all the kids. It's us against them. But yeah. as you get into training session and you're on the other team from the person, the kids around that age aren't stupid, so they know what's going to wind yeah. Tom up. They know, okay, if I start doing this to yeah. Simon. This is going to get reaction, which means my team might win better. I think that's a really interesting dynamic for you to manage as a coach as well, because you want it to be competitive and you want, you know, people to have that exposure to really challenge environment. But along with that has this kind of secondary thing where the kids, you know, naturally they're going to try and drift with the line in order to win. Uh, I don't know what your experiences are around that. Yeah, I would say the the kids are even better than uh, adults or opposition at winding each other up because they spend like in, in an academy football they spend so much time with each other, not just on the pitch but off the pitch as well. It's like having a brother, a brother or sister knows exactly what to do to make you kind of lose your marbles, don't they? They know what will annoy you and what will wind you up. I think maybe as adults, that kind of um, you know fully developed brain or, or nearly fully developed in some cases, we've got that that capability to go right what's going on what's happening why is it happening what do i need to do da, 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 da. okay cool i've got it i think with kids and young people occasionally you might just have to go mike what's going on here and they go well tommy's doing this thing and it's annoying me da, da. okay why is he doing that thing because he wants to win and he wants to make it hard for me and once you kind of turn that uh notch they go ah okay and then it turns into a game moment so like you, you maybe got that kind of diego costa kind of he's getting in your ear and he's trying to annoy you and you get some kids that are just completely like okay cool they're like they're in the zone now i'm ignoring him um but you maybe just need to help them with that bridge i guess of what's going on and why is it going on and do you know what's going on like he, he's not he's not he's not doing that because he hates you he's doing that because he wants to win and so you've either got to just to find the strategy find a way to to make it work um, and again that would kind of come back to expectations i think the, the other common example is when the kids start really smashing each other in tackles. So I don't know if you've found this, but in youth football, the kids are more aggressive with each other than they are with the opposition. So on a, on a training night, they will smash each other and like really borderline tackles. And then there might be some games where they go, oh, these kids are really big. And you're like, they aren't any bigger than people that you smash every Tuesday. So I don't know why that's entered your head. But again, comes back to expectations of like, are we okay smashing each other? because that's what you want it to look like. It's competitive. But if someone's not okay with that and, you know, they get upset or they think the tackles are too much, then, you know, we'll come back to that kind of group expectation piece of, you know, we said we wanted to be competitive. Is that competitive or is that cheating or is that, you know, across that line? And just kind of keep coming back to that. What does it look like for us? Um, but yeah, that, that, the, the kids are definitely really well skilled at winding each other up and, uh, and saying the wrong thing at the wrong time to, to get a reaction. But we probably just need to help them uh, know why it's happening and what they're looking at. Yeah, I really like the framing that you can do with the kids around the competitive stuff because um, I think you, you get different groups. Some groups are uber competitive. I find it really interesting from year to year. You get some that are uber, uber competitive and you have to kind of, it's always a bubbling point and your job as a coach is to help them manage that to make sure it doesn't go over the line. You get others where it's really hot and cold. Sometimes it's really competitive and other nights it's like, no, nah, we're just all there for a game of football. And mm -hmm. that's fine. And the one thing that I, I, I like to frame it is saying, if they're being competitive with you, if that person's being competitive with you, it's making you better. Because as a, you know, as a um, defender, if I've got an attacker who's being really competitive and every time he gets the ball, he's smashing it as hard as he can in the back of the net. Well, in order to stop him doing that, I've got to compete, number one, but I've got to be good with all my tech and tack stuff. Mm -hmm. The other way around, if I've got someone who's smashing into me, well, for me as a player on the ball, I've got to make decisions quicker. Is it going to pass? I'm going to dribble. Am I going to do a double movement to get myself more space? So one of the big selling points, I think, to the kids around this is if you're competitive, this group is competitive in the right nature, 
is it improves you all. It makes everyone better. I have to defend better, which makes you attack better, which then makes me defend better. And it's like a melting pot of you're going to make your mate better so that on a weekend, hopefully we've all helped one another to go and perform well a weekend. Yeah. It's the, the idea of like co-adaptation, right? Like the, the, like you said, the, the, if you're a better defender, I become a better forward and so on and so on. Again, like a real magical space is where you can get, and this is difficult with very young kids, but I'd say 12, 13 upwards, I found are able to do it. If you can get a central defender to talk to a number nine or vice versa and go, I find it really difficult when you do this. And you, when you did this, that meant I couldn't run in behind. Or if you can get them into that space, it, it, it's really cool. That, um, that under 15 session that I was trying to explain that was full pitch with the breakout rondo. Whilst we were doing the rondo thing, um, the sports scientist was working with the number nine on his on his movements. The number nine was talking to the goalkeeper about, I dinked over you because you went down too early. And then the goalkeeper would be like, okay, cool, I changed this. And then they were talking, basically going like, when you do this, I find it really hard to score. Or when you do this, I find it really hard to put it over you. I'll go around you. And that was like, again, gold dust. Like they're, they're, Because although he's given away his secrets, that's what's going to help him when he plays at Chelsea or Spurs or whoever because he's going to go, when I go down too early, that number nine will dink me, or if I stay up big, I'm going to force him wide or whatever. So I think you can kind of use that principle to even open up conversations peer to peer. Um, I haven't seen it work with really young ones. It, it might do. But yeah, with, with that kind of start at the teenage age group, I think once you've explained that we're trying to make each other better and this will help us become better players and also help us on a Saturday, Sunday, then you can start to see them go, well, yeah, when, when you touch it past me with your first touch, I'm, I'm in real trouble. So you know, don't do that all the time because I'm going to start to practice this skill. Um, that, that's really cool. Have you, have you had any experience of that working with, with the younger ones? Yeah, it, it does. Um, I think it needs a little bit of coach guidance with it just in terms of um, maybe asking appropriate questions. So go, what do you notice about Sally? Well, she's really quick. Okay, so how, if she's really quick, how can we make it difficult for her? And then it might say, okay, well, if I don't get tight, that means there's less space for her to run in behind. And then I'm not going to have that race. Um, yeah. So there's, that's the main way of doing it. You can't, you can do it. it. Obviously, as they get a bit older, they're able to articulate stuff a little bit easier. So quite a lot of it will, will be coach prompting. Um, I think on this, which is really interesting, and people will probably be bored of me talking about this because I've said it before, which is, um, I've seen videos online of um, England rugby are very good with this. Um, I've seen Maro Otoje um, um, doing a session regarding, I think, uh, rucking and scrummaging. And they were doing a judo session and uh, they went in and just facilitated the players saying, when you do this with your body, it makes it really challenging for me. Um, and so that was really good. But what the, probably the best example I've seen in this is in mixed martial arts. Okay. Um, I spoke to a guy called Tom Reed um, in one of the earlier podcasts and he was saying after a world championship um, for that year, all the athletes stay and do a two day training camp. Wow. Um, and he said, obviously you wouldn't give them kind of all of your secrets and stuff. He said, because obviously if I'm competing in worlds and stuff, but they would all stay, they all do a training camp together and help work on little techniques of things that maybe that they do particularly well or go, well, why do you position your hand there? And if it's not something that's too thingy, they, they would help teach one another. Um, and I said to him, you know, how did it, that come about? How did you get to that stage? And they said, one, it's a respect thing and a, a brand thing for judo in terms of, you know, that is the thing you, you pass on to your youngers or you, you know, you respect your elders or that type of stuff. And he said, then too, it's just a training partner thing. You, you have your training partners. And in order for me to get better, I need my training partner to get better. So yeah. when you're training with that person, particularly if it's away from that two day thing, they, um, they want them to get better. So they'll constantly drip feed them this information. So that now it's more challenging for me when I'm rolling with that person and when I'm playing with that person, which I think that is a really interesting dynamic as culturally as a sport to have that. Yeah, I think football's quite, I don't know what the words are, insular. And um, yeah, the idea of having a secret source or something that no one's ever seen before, I 
think that's that's quite quite apparent in football that we think our methodology or our approach or our players or whatever have something that you don't have. I think other sports are a bit more transparent and they like the challenge or the opportunity, I suppose, to get better. I, I read something similar online around the uh, England under-18s rugby team playing Scotland. And then afterwards they had they had uh, peer-to-peer debriefs. So imagine, I don't know a lot about rugby, so I'll be rubbish at positions. But you and I, I I'm English, you're Scottish, we play a game. Then at the end, you and I sit face-to-face and go, this thing that your team did killed us and, you know, we should have defended like this. Or we noticed that when, you know, did this thing, I did this thing. So they seem to have that similar, um, yeah, respect and approach to, to, to getting better, I guess. Yeah, I know we've done some work with uh, Russell Earnshaw and John Fletcher um, from the Magic Academy and I've had the, them guys on. And one of the things they discussed is about potentially working collaboratively with his coaching group. So say, for example, we're playing... Um, Arsenal at the weekend we'd get together as a four before and we'd say right today we're going to work together as a group to aid all sides so I might be looking at um, centre halves playing between between lines trying to penetrate but I'm doing it for both teams Mm -hmm. Um, you would do the same midfield rotations or receiving on the half turn midfield and then as a four you work over the two teams or over the two things and you debrief to all the players of the same position and then allow them to discuss kind of during the game what that looks like or what they're finding challenging. Um, I think in order for that to happen, you'd have to have a particularly good relationship with the other team and the other coaches. But I think that would be really powerful if you're playing against particularly teams from somewhere else that you might might get different types of football, different types of player. The ability just to talk about little intricacies of the game for the players would would be really, I think, a really interesting concept to put in place. Yeah, again, comes back to kind of culture, right? Like in tradition, and that doesn't happen, so we won't do that. Like that's you've gone crazy, crazy talk. Um, but yeah, it, it would create loads of great learning for the kids, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I know, like, obviously, from your experiences, you've worked kind of in, in the London area and stuff, and I know from speaking to different people, kind of, you can get different different kid being two mile, different type of kid two miles down the road to a different type of kid and stuff. And I think that the, your ability to share over an hour and a half distance, which would be very different upbringing, very different culturally, very different values, very different techniques of what they've learned, the ability to go and actually channel those in a game setting would, would would be amazing for the kids if you could do it. It'd be brilliant. And like, I suppose one of the, again, challenges with youth football is you get a coach for a year or you get two coaches for a year. Like, wouldn't it be brilliant if they had five coaches for the year? Because there's always going to be some kid that gets more inspired or more um, connected or whatever with, with some individual. And so you could maybe not maximise that year if, if you're, if you're not fully connected or you don't like fully respect the coach or like the coach so the more voices or or or, yeah opinions around the players might be good I think there's probably a sweet spot if you had 25 coaches that probably wouldn't work but maybe having four or five different voices or um yeah again different biases there might be a coach that loves attacking players that loves 1v1s that take risk um yeah no so I guess for me, kind of coming back to the end, you mentioned like your work with the player the development project. I guess it'd be interesting to hear how you came up with the concepts because obviously a lot of the things we've discussed today is work that you would have done with them or research you would have done with them. So what was behind the project in its first instance? How did how did you go about helping hope, uh, helping to co-found it? Yeah, so so that the project is 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 not mine. Like um, the the co-founders are uh, a guy called Dave Wright. Um, not related and his brother Adam and another chap called James Vaughan so um, I used to work with Dave at Brentford Um, so Dave and Adam are from New Zealand and Dave worked at Brentford and then at Fulham and he now works for high performance New Zealand sport obviously in New Zealand and his brother um, is more of a kind of IT based website builder and, and graphic designer and then James Vaughan is head of research at AIK in Stockholm so he's been doing lots of research around uh, creativity and sport and kind of the social cultural link between what happens in the environment to what happens on the pitch. So those three guys um, knew each other and it kind of bounced around. And then I got sucked in uh, via Dave. 
and so initially it started off as like a um a magazine and an app so the, the magazine was kind of just people similar to this conversation talking about ideas or interviews or blogs that, that were stuff they're interested in and then there was an app that was um going to be used to kind of help players and player development so it was kind of around practice and, and role modeling and kind of tying in some of this stuff that we think is important and turning it into child-friendly language and trying to help the young people and then it's kind of like I guess like really snowballed into this thing so it's now you know uh, the, the website is it's full of um I think we've got over a thousand pieces of content in terms of blogs and, and webinars and pod podcasts and research reviews which are pretty cool because it takes the research which is often really wordy and complicated and, and breaks it down into to, to some more kind of simplified language and, and take away from coaches so it's now turned into like a, a global community of coaches that, that are looking to get better and then we've got a few a few partner clubs so uh, Birmingham City, AIK, uh, Brisbane Raw, Fulham, there's probably a few others that I'm forgetting. Pompey have, have also joined where we support their coaches with their CPD. And so we, we try and get kind of experts in their field and ask them a few questions. And then there's also a learning space where we use a, a Slack community to talk, talk to coaches. And those coaches really range from like grassroots mom and dads that maybe have got full-time jobs and they just want some help with this one thing. Like, like you talked about competition that, and, and game time. Those are things, questions we get all the time. We've also got like a licensed national technical directors that are involved in that community. So they've got big problems around like what, what formation should we be playing and, and what age should we go to what formation? So we've got all of that kind of stuff in the background. So it keeps you, keeps you kind of sharp having all these conversations all the time. And I suppose what's been useful is like it really, um, it challenge, challenges and maybe solidifies also some of your thoughts because there's, I think everyone's got opinions on, on football and sport and kids and like you go in with a certain set of, of ideas and then maybe those become more solidified because you get some research or some opinions that back it up and there's others you go hang on a minute I know nothing about anything here I need to I need to go away and unpick that so it's been it's been really rich like really really good and, and, and full of learning. And was there anything in particular that's challenged you um in terms of thought process or problems that other people you've had and gone i didn't even think about that but that's a real interesting thought. yeah i i don't know maybe challenge but maybe more like the evolution of i think i think most coaches go through this evolution or, or it's definitely been true for me of like you you start on your journey really wanting to know around football stuff so tactics and shapes and formations and practices and periodizations and all this stuff which is definitely 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 important and then the bigger bubble and the more uh i suppose i was less skilled in and, and less experienced in was the people stuff so like you, you you talked about coaching kids in london and and the social cultural you know why the kids the way they are and why do they value what they value and why do they play the way they play i was probably um practicing some of that stuff and had some ideas but didn't didn't know why it was like it is and so talking to some of these people or, or, or understanding some of these approaches that people are using you know from from kind of motivational interviewing to, to Jimmy's research around uh, he spent a year in Barcelona and, and, and why Barcelona play the way they play and why they value football the way they do all of that stuff I think you you get snippets of it in in autobiographies and podcasts and stuff but I, I wasn't able to fully understand kind of why I coach the way I coach and why do we treat people the way we treat them and that is probably really now become um priority on my coaching so the kids in front of me are more important than the session design and the formation and the tactics and all that kind of stuff so I need to know like schooling and brothers and sisters and like you said what winds them up what what interests them you know what's the footballing background so that we can begin to have an idea of okay that's why they play like that that's what they think is important to them or that's why they don't fully understand that thing yet because someone hasn't shown them or that's why they like that coach because they really like it when they're involved in the learning when you get into that stuff the session design becomes really easy so I talked earlier about the vulnerability of so showing this session might be rubbish i'd like to think that the, that group of players have probably got a bit of rapport with where they know when Dan says that, he knows he's trying to design something that might be good for us, that might help us, that might be good fun. So we'll probably try and help him a little bit with, you know, let's do X, Y, Z. So I think once you 
start to unpick some of that stuff and i'm definitely not an expert in it once you start to unpick some of that stuff you you get there's there's loads more things to explore it's really exciting to to you know we, we've all coached in a certain way and done an intervention that you thought was absolutely you know diamond and then you use the same intervention a week later and it, you get completely mugged off completely pied and that's the joy of coaching of like ah that didn't work and whether it's like you said scribbles on a piece of paper or, or I'm really trying to inspire and motivate Mike to do this thing. And then he doesn't do it or he doesn't want to do it. Why doesn't he want to do it? And I find that really, like, really good fun. Um, I know there's times where, you know, if I had any hair, people, you, you pull your hair out, but it's brilliant. That's why I love coaching the people that we work with and the the challenge and, and joy you can get from working with people. So that's that's been the kind of evolution, I guess, of how important that stuff is. Um, yeah, that, that, that's been the journey. I guess the interesting side as well is that by having such a global network of of this and of coaches and whatnot, it allows you to kind of see behind the curtains in so many different cultures and the problems or the challenges that people face in these different cultures. Um, yeah. so I imagine, you know, the, the situation in Scandinavia and the, the fact that pitches might freeze over at certain times of the year be very different to Australia where it's hot majority of the year and it's absolutely fine so imagine for you that must have been a real rich learning um, experience to be able to go and although people come into you for expertise but also just to be able to question them and go oh I hadn't even thought about that being an issue or yeah. that's the problem you've got there relates really well to what I'm seeing with this player yeah. five thousand miles away yeah it it all comes back to that context doesn't it of like you know like using the example you used earlier i want a session on defending wide areas okay well i can get you a session on defending wide areas and it can be a pdf and it can look brilliant but we need to understand the context of what you're doing and there's lots of people in the community that would do a lot of their training indoors so maybe six months of the year I'm in an indoor space we've got it for 60 minutes well you're probably not doing defending in wide areas then if you're in a sports hall for 60 minutes like you probably should be doing something game-based that's that's you know fast-paced that's full of decisions so you, you there's almost like a, um i suppose a, a new bunch of questions that go at the beginning okay what are the kids in front of us what are the space we've got available you know what what is all that kind of stuff then we can talk about session design and i think people jump into session design because they believe there's some you know Mourinho's plans or Guardiola's plans or and when you do see some of that stuff you go oh okay it's a Ronda or oh, okay it's a small set of game or oh, okay it's you know it's possession practice there isn't many practices that you go whoa I've never seen that before it's amazing the amazing stuff they do is is around interventions and relationships and people stuff that's the amazing things those people do like the returns are a Pochettino or a Mourinho or whoever you know whoever you like Klopp Klopp is not doing sessions that are very different to other people. It's just the way he's inspiring the, the, the people he works with or, you know, developing them or improving them. So that there's like all this, I suppose, in my mind, there's these new questions that have jumped in front, the contextual questions of, okay, so why are the kids there? Like we get questions around competition that we've talked about. Like the kids aren't competitive enough. Okay, have you asked them why they're there? Well, they might be there to play with their mates and run around for a bit. Like they might not want to play in the Premier League. So that these things I wouldn't have thought about 10 years ago. I'd have gone like, everybody needs the same thing and it needs to be competitive. All of it. And I do believe that in high performance. But if the context is, you know, under six, first experience of football and mums and dads are on the side, competition probably isn't priority. Like it's probably about them enjoying it and falling in love with the game and having chances to, to stick in a goal. So, yeah, to join the conversation up using the FAYCD uh, comment, you wouldn't want an under six having three shots at goal in a 60 minute session. You want him to have probably as many as you can, because that's why he's there. So all that context across the globe is, is, is super different. And then, yeah, talking to people in different environments. And I've, I've had a few opportunities to coach in those different environments as well. You just, there's times where you go, well, that didn't work. Like this thing that I do, you know, in Southampton, or this thing that I did in London, it was brilliant. I know that intervention works. When I try it in this other place, I look like an idiot. Like, okay, cool. I'm gonna have to try something different and that just makes you sharper and, and better as a coach like it's it's not comfortable in the moment but it can make you yeah it can make you better and where do you see this going in terms of for you guys is there any particular plans you've got moving forward or is it just to keep growing the community and um just trying to keep learning and hopefully helping others to learn yeah i i think like the 
the the approach of the project has gone in loads of different places that we didn't expect it to go. So the, the club partnerships are really cool. So talk, talking to these other clubs about around their challenges that they were having, there are times where you go, like you said, we've got a really similar a challenge here, or you know, we reckon that these things worked in this this you know situation before. Or there's challenges where clubs go. Um, so we've recently done some workshops with some with a partner school in Australia. And the questions that they asked and the concerns that they had or that their, their kind of you know 10 top 10 things they want answered i would have never thought about some of them like they either because in our environment those questions wouldn't have been asked or they aren't things that we have to worry about or you know like if, if you're a, an aussie child or parent how do we get to the premier league how do we get to the english premier league I don't know that's a hell of a journey like it's going to be really difficult and then it was like is that the priority at under 12 should we be talking about some other things so that, that, that's been really cool. Um, but it, ha it has gone in a number of ways or a number of different directions. And I think like maybe tied in with the COVID stuff, people are getting more comfortable with online learning and informal learning. I think maybe coach education will always have a place and people getting formal qualifications and maybe um, it being kind of off the shelf and quite um, standardized not completely standardized but quite standardized is cool but then the space is like i want to get better at this i want to get better at asking questions i want to get better at designing sessions i want to get better at dealing you know working and and, and interacting with parents i want to get better at curriculum design that's probably where the 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 magic is and the, the the ability to to impact change and there isn't many places you can go to get real kind of tailored individual learning um, like I said, it got kind of over a thousand pieces of content. So if you only want stuff on skill acquisition or sports science or whatever, you can just click the tab and, and go and read all of that stuff. It sounds like a very long sales pitch, but, but essentially what we're trying to do is get on-demand learning. So I'm not interested in that stuff, but this stuff I'm really interested in, show me all of that. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you're interested in research papers, then there's a place to go. If you're interested in, in working with parents, there's a place to go. So I suppose we're always kind of reacting to, to what, what's coming back from from the parents and the clubs and you know kind of coming out of the, the system and then trying to find resources or experts that can that can support them but but where it will go who knows we're just kind of yeah we're just kind of reacting to, to what's coming back which has been it's been really good fun and like yeah full, full of uh, opportunity to talk to to bright people and to go i don't know anything about that i need to go away and read some books or yeah go away and think about some good questions because this person knows you know tons and tons of this area that i know nothing about and I'm sure you'll um, you'll have experience the same way I have on this podcast. Is that the more people you speak to, the less you realise you know. <laughs> you kind of speak to people and you're like, okay, I hadn't even thought about that, or actually, that's you know, extenuation of what I do. And um, I think that you're you're probably in that space at the minute with the amount of dialogue you can have with people. It really broadens your horizons to you know areas that you can develop or things that you do really well yeah and 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 that's definitely definitely true but i think the flip is true as well when you have um 50 conversations with people around youth development or talent development or whatever we want to call it there are a few things that keep coming back to the front and that's also really useful so like i think relationship building with kids and parents is always going to be important whether you're you know, high performance or grassroots or under 10s or 21s, that, those things are always going to keep coming back. And those keep being common themes with, with people that I speak to around um, either their support network or their relationship with a coach or the relationship with a certain person, help them get to, get to there. Um, and I don't know if you found that, talking to a number of people, there are a few headlines that keep coming back or like a golden thread that runs through um, a few different things. Is there, any, is there anything that you've, that you've kind of gone... Yeah, that one. People always talk about that. The top thing, there's no magic answer. Everyone has the idea of what you said there is that, you know, Pep Guardiola has the magic answer or Klopp has a magic answer. There is no magic answer. And in actual fact, most people that are educated in a field, be it football or rugby or whatever, they have a relatively good understanding of technical and tactical under like needs for that game. The, the bit around it for me is the getting to know the people and at times just being in the right place with the right people at the right time. Yeah. Um, I think that, staying curious, right? Like being open to learn from those people. Rather yeah, than being able to learn from them. 
And I think at the top end, having the right people that respond well to you. So, you know, if you had uh, Jurgen Klopp at Tottenham, would he be as successful with that group of players who will have very different dynamics and very different things? I don't know. Possibly he would. But I think yeah. there's a real case to be made that surrounding yourself and this is probably what managers struggle with because of the lifetime of a manager at a club, but actually surrounding yourself with players that suit the way that you want to do things and suit your Process. interactions and processes. Mm -hmm. It's probably the bit that we find hard at the moment. Um, and I think like you look at Oli, he's Oli going to Solskjaer, like him or loathe him. It seems like he's getting to a stage now where there's maybe he's getting rid of some of those players and is getting some people in who buy into his vision. Arteta potentially is doing the same, is trying to get rid of players that don't necessarily do things the way that fits for him. And I think yeah. that, um, something that we can get better at as, as a um, sport is to realise if I try and get rid of a player, doesn't mean that he's a bad player. Mm -hmm. We seem to have this idea if you want to sell him, oh, it's because he's no, no good. It could just be he just doesn't fit exactly what I want to do. So if I look at someone like Paul Pogba, um, for me, I think Paul Pogba is an outstanding player. I think he's brilliant. I think he's really good. Some of the stuff he can do on the ball. But if you gave me the opportunity of having him or Kante, I'd have Kante. Because my bias towards that type of player is I know what I'm going to get from Kante, the work rate and stuff. I have a bias towards that type of player. So if you said to me, you can sell Pogba and get a Kante, I'd do it. That doesn't mean I think Paul Pogba is a bad player at all. What I'm basically just saying is for the way that I'd want to play, the way that I would want things to run, I'd want this type of player. So that's probably the one of the biggest takeaways for me is that there's no secret answer. No one has a, a little recipe that they're hiding in their back pocket and going, well, this is what we do. It's just being with the good people at the right time and building those relationships well yeah. enough to have success in the long term. Yeah, I didn't realise you were on first name basis with Ollie. That's good. Yeah, me and Muck, isn't we? And uh, to choose between Pogba and Kante is a nice, uh, a nice dilemma. Too well yeah, well, I don't, that that's um, footy manager problems. That isn't it? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm experience, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, I haven't got the money to actually be able to buy him. Otherwise, uh, my under eleven team would be absolutely flying. Yeah, yeah, Pogba would be a very ill immature for under eleven. Yeah. Cool. Listen, Dan. Last question, because I appreciate we've been on for a little while. Which is um, something I ask everyone. Which is who's the the best player you've worked with or against, or why? Or who's the best coach you've worked with or against, and why? Oh crikey! Just so that people listen to, there was absolutely no prep for that at all. Um, best players. Um, I was fortunate, probably for. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, first of all, I hate it when coaches go, I coach this player and now he's the best player in the world. So I'm definitely not taking credit for any of these young people that I've coached for an hour. Um, I was fortunate for six months, only once a week, to work with uh, Giancarlo Paveda, who's now at Leeds. So he came to Brentford as a 14-year-old from Barca and he uh, reset my expectations of what good looked like. Um, I can remember we were in a futsal hall and the the, the, the evening was games-based, but we did like a, te a technical 20-minute window. And the idea was to do something really out of the box, really fast-paced that was just touching the ball. And so I thought, got these players in front of me, I'm going to do something really difficult. They, they were 15s or 16s at this stage. And I got a bunch of tennis balls and I thought, I'll do ball mastery with the tennis balls because they'll find that really difficult. And Jan Carlos, calm as you want, picked the tennis ball up out of the bucket and did a hundred keep you ups first time, picked the ball up and went, what are we doing? And I thought, I'm in for a tough session here. He also did some stuff around um, kind of breaking the rules and cheating. So we'd play a futsal game. And again, remember this really clearly. I was working with a coach called Gabriel Flores and it, we did this games night and it went through to a final. And in the final, it was the last minute and his team were winning and he went to goal and the goalkeeper saved it and they were counter-attacking and he not even nearly tried to tackle. He tripped the guy up because he was through on goal and Gabes was refereeing the, the game, sent him off and they then played the last 30 seconds, four against five, whatever it was. And then afterwards we explored like, did Jan Carla make the right decision? And he he's from a Colombian background, uh, English Colombian. 
And he went, but that's what I did to win the game. And there was no like pause and breath or hesitation. And again, the cultural, like, this is what I would do to win the game with 30 seconds going. I would trip him and stop him scoring. And we really explored that as a group because there's some of the kids like, he's a cheat and he should be able to play next week. And, and he was really comfortable with like, you know, that's I what you do. Right. Yeah. So that, so that was one player. I, I, I've worked with a few others. Like it, it would be difficult to, to, to name all of them. Um, but yeah, a few others. In terms of coaches, someone that again, kind of really reshaped my way of understanding would be Stuart English. Um, we have got a lot of content with Stuart English on the player development project. So you can, you can go and check that out. But Stu was really keen on kind of developing individuals and, and probably really opened my mind and my eyes to what that looked like. So I think everybody would say they try and develop individuals, but, but Stu's approach to individual learning plans and putting kids at the center of practices. And why did you do that practice when you've got those kids and all that kind of stuff? He really probably started me on this kind of roller coaster. Um, and then someone I've worked with really recently would be Graham Mills. Um, so Graham, super bright guy, like uh, lectures at a, a university and uh, works within academy football, but someone that, yeah, I had a, a really good relationship with and probably a really kind of, again, that utopia of putting sessions on and, him, and me go, and him going, you need to change this bit because it's not working. And then there'd be other times where we would just kind of almost co-coach without having to plan it. Um, so yeah, th those would be kind of some of the people at, at the headlines. The player ones, the player ones really difficult. Um, yeah, I work with a few other young players that hopefully in four or five years we could talk about, but I suppose it's not appropriate to to list them at the moment, where, but hopefully maybe we can come back and, and revisit that. No, perfect. Listen, Dan, I really appreciate your time. And I think a uh, great conversation, which hopefully um, people have taken a lot away from, same as I have. And uh, fingers crossed when we get out of lockdown, we can catch up and um, go, um, yeah, see each other face to face rather than over a screen. Thanks, mate. Thanks for the time. It's been really good. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.